We've been on this series um, about honoring God with our money, with our finances. We've been on this series since 1967. We're about to finish it. This is part five, I think. Um, it's very important. A lot of, lot of uh, you know, a lot of people don't, a lot of pastors and preachers don't like to talk about it because then they feel like they're getting judged. But you know what? Just like we talk about everything else in the Word of God, see, this book is the most, this, this, this is not just a book. This is the holy written Word of God. And this is life. I like how somebody put it, the Bible is basic. Uh, how is it? It's called basic instructions before leaving earth, which is true. Um, I want to talk to you today about putting God first. We've been talking about that. We're going to talk about putting God first. And in order for us to put God first, listen, you're never really going to be blessed in your life. Once you give your life to Jesus and you're a Christian, you've surrendered, he's the Lord of your life, you've got to put God first in every area of your life to have God's full blessing. But it takes these three things, faith, say faith. faith. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's going to take trust. Everybody say trust. trust. And then it's going to take obedience. Everybody say obedience. obedience. Today, I'm going, to, I'm going to really focus in on the word trust. I want to talk to you, and we're going to end the service with, we're going to be talking about trusting God. I want to challenge your thinking about, do you really trust God? And how important that is to trust God. Very, very important. Now, I have a question for you guys. Everybody here knows what's taking place in the United States. You can't find baby formula. I went to the gas, gas station the other day, and I, it's $6.50 a gallon. I mean, we all know what's taking place. It has nothing, this is not political or anything like that. It's just, so I have a question I want to ask you. I had to tell somebody the other day, I said, quit listening to the news and start, start listening to God's word. Because the person was like speaking all kinds of negative stuff, man. Like, oh my God, they are right, right, right. I said, stop listening to the stupid news. It's depressing. What is God's word? So because of that, I got a question for you today. Are you listening to me? Everybody here in the sanctuary listening to me? Oh, I'm going to yell, flip, spit, shout. Okay, so we're listening, right? Those watching online? Is it possible... What? She was listening. That's scary. I'm telling you. Have, don't watch. It reminds me of that movie, Enemy of the State. Okay. Anyways. <laughs> okay. I wasn't even. My phone wasn't even on. That's scary. Okay. All right. Is it possible? For God to bless us in difficult times. What's your answer? Yes. What's your answer? Yes. yes. Okay. The answer, according to God's word, is yes, yes, yes. It's possible not only to survive, but to thrive, to be blessed. Why? Because we're not in man's economy, we're in God's economy. And God owns all the silver and gold. God can make a way where there is no way. God will always provide. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or a seed begging bread. But the first step is to recognize that God is our source. Listen, your source is not even your, you may think it's your job or you may think it's whatever company or whatever it is you do. But really, it's ultimately, it's God. Somebody say, it's God. Your ability to prosper is determined by God Almighty, not by this economy. I'm going to say it again, not by this economy. And um, I'm going to read you something. In Deuteronomy, before we start, I want you to listen to this. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, if you'd like to turn there, feel free. If not, I'm going to read it to you. Deuteronomy chapter 8, starting verse 11. I think we're going to put it on the screens. If not, listen. Be careful. That you do not forget the Lord your God. 
and in failing to observe his commands, his laws, his decrees that I am giving you this day. Verse 12, otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and you settle down, when your herds and flocks or your cupboards and refrigerator, your bank accounts, huh, your garage, your silver and gold has increased and all you have has multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Woo! He delivered us and set us free. Say amen. amen. Out of the hand of slavery. We were slaves to the, the sins that we were involved in. And then he skipped down, verse 17 says, And you may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. I like what one translation says, well, you'll say to yourself, my own abilities have caused me to have everything I have now. Verse 18, but remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives us, come on somebody, the ability to produce wealth. And so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your forefathers. So we see that God is able. Somebody say God is able. Now, how many of you are better off right now than when you first got saved? How many of you are better off right now? Come on, hasn't God been good to us? Think about it. I know I say that over and over. How many of you are better off? We're blessed. We're blessed. It's because of God. We've been talking about giving. Giving is an issue of the heart. It really is. Now, Mark chapter 12. Turn your Bibles there. I want you to see this. If you have your phones, open up your Bible app. Look at the Word of God. Mark chapter 12. I'm going to read it to you. We're going to read uh, 41 through 44. It should be up on the screens also. Mark chapter 12. This is about Jesus. Jesus cares about our giving. <laughs> you better believe. How many know Jesus watches everything? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah. All right. Mark chapter 12. <laughs> Jesus sat opposite the place. Listen. Jesus sat. Opposite, opposite the place where the offerings were put and watch the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples, Jesus said, Truly I tell you this, poor widow, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. And he explains why. They gave out of their abundance or out of their wealth. But she gave out of her poverty. She put, every, she put in everything, all that she had to live on. Wow, that's heavy. So there's no one that could say, I can't afford to honor God with my tithe. If you do that, you're never going to prosper. You're going to stay exactly where you're at. And let me tell you something about giving. Giving is an issue of the heart. It doesn't, see, whether you give or not, it doesn't affect the church because God will always provide. It's about your life, about you being blessed, about God God opening the windows of heaven in your life and pouring out. That's why every source of income, you should honor the Lord with a tithe. Every source. Of, you know that when I get Pentecostal, for instance, Thursday, I went to go speak. I'm going to tell on myself. I went to go speak at the uh, Holy Ghost Thursday, right? And so they gave me an honorarium. Did you know that I got two Pentecostal handshakes? That ended up being more than my honorarium. And my honorarium was good. See, you can't control. You, you, it's seed time and harvest. It's, it's because I've been doing this for years. I give Pentecostal handshakes everywhere I go to. It's something that I do. See, you, God, you, God, the reason why that's in the Bible, I want you to catch this. Listen, listen, catch the word of God. The Bible says Jesus said opposite 
of where they were putting in the money. Do you think that was an accident that he just sat down right there? Come on, talk to me. It's intentional. What is he trying to tell us? Why is it in the word of God? Why did the Holy Spirit put that in the word of God? To tell us Jesus watches what we give. Because he wants to give back to us good measure. Somebody say good measure. Yeah. Press down. Yeah. Shaking together. Come on. And running over in your life. Why does God want you to be blessed so you can be a blessing to others? If you hoard it, you're, you're, that's it. God doesn't bless selfishness. God is a giver. And we're more like God when we're givers, when we care, when we love, we give time. I, I've learned, I'm telling you. You want love? Give love. You want mercy? Give mercy. You want compassion? Show compassion. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. See, it's an issue of the heart. You know why some people don't? Some people don't give when they should or don't tithe off of whatever income that comes into their lives because it's an issue of the heart. When you, when you fully, tr and it's an issue of trusting God. How many of you trust God here? No, if you trust God, I want you to raise your hand. The Lord is, Jesus is watching right now. So, so listen, come on. If you trust God, raise your hand. If you say you trust God, raise your hand. I'm, come on. Okay, do you guys trust God? Is it the truth or did you just raise your hand? Think with me. Do you really trust God? Then think about your actions. In every area of your life, do you trust God? Do you really trust him that he'll provide for you? He could heal you. He can open a door. Do you really believe God that, do you trust God that he could change somebody you've been praying for? Or have you given up hope? Trust. Somebody say trust. trust. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Trust. Say trust. trust. This is heavy. Now one more scripture. Go to Luke chapter 12. We went to Mark chapter 12. Now we're going to walk over to Luke. Let's walk over to Luke, the 12th, the 12th chapter. Luke chapter 12. I'm going to read you another story about Jesus. Luke chapter 12. Are you there? We're going to start in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. <laughs> Verse 14. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator between you? Verse 15. Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Isn't that heavy that he said all kinds of greed? Mm. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. He's not saying that you shouldn't have possessions, because how many of you are better off right now when you first got saved? Aren't we? Come on, he's been good to us. It's not that. It's you can't let the possessions have you. That's the difference. That's the difference between having a struggle with greed and not. Watch this. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, verse 16. And he told them this parable. Here we go. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. Verse 19, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Verse 20, but God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Who then will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. 
It's heavy, huh? It's about the attitude of your heart, of my heart. God wants us to be blessed. He says he takes pleasure. You want to make God happy? How many of you want to make God happy? Amen. Then prosper. The Bible says he takes pleasure in the prosperity of his children. So he wants us to be blessed. I want everybody to say, let me tell you. You know what? I'm going to tell you something heavy. In case you didn't know this, life and death are in the power of your tongue. Do you fully understand that? Do you really fully understand that? Life and death are the, I'm telling you, if there's anything I have learned is words have power. There are things that I have spoken into existence, prayed into existence that didn't, and I kept saying it for years, and now I've seen it come to pass. I want everybody to say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Come on, say it. I'm blessed. I'm, blessed. I'm prosperous. I'm blessed. I have divine health. I have divine prosperity. I'm God's son or God's daughter, whatever you are, amen. Come on, say it. Say, my unsaved loved ones will be saved. I'm the head and not the tail. Come on, say, I'm more than a conqueror. I'm blessed coming in, and I'm blessed going out. If you're married, say, I have a great marriage. Woo! If you have a bank account, say, I have a blessed bank account. I want some of you to say, if it's true, if not speak it into existence, I'm going to be debt free. That's right. Come on. Come on. Life and death are in the power. Say, I'm going to live a long life. My dad's been saying that, and he's going to be 85. You know what he did? Don't tell nobody. Shh. He took his motorcycle out for a ride, came back with a brand new motorcycle. He just bought another motorcycle. He did. He traded in his three-wheeler, the one he had, it, to, for another brand new one. He just came home. I'm like, what? He goes, I'm going to live a long life. I'm prosperous. God is blessing me. And then he says, how you like that one, devil? Woo! Life and death are in the power of your tongue, church. The Bible is the greatest investment manual ever printed. And Jesus wants all of his children to become master investors. There's nothing greater when you invest in the kingdom of God because you, you don't lose it. You get it back. Yeah. It isn't like the stock market. Huh? It's proven and true. Out of 38 parables, we just read one, 16 of them deal with how to manage your possessions. The Bible says more about how to manage your finances than even heaven and hell combined. There are more than 2,000 verses on financial prosperity. Financial prosperity. And how to handle your material possessions. Now the important thing is that we trust God. We got to really trust God. Trust God. Somebody say trust God. trust God. Okay. I don't have the keys to my car. But if I did, I would pull them out right now and show you a key. Right? So just imagine I have a key in my hand. You guys, all, everybody see the key? <laughs> The key to successful living is simply trusting God. Trust God with everything. He's going to turn it around. Trust God. God's in control. What issue are you facing where you need to have trust, faith, and obedience? Trust God. Trust God. I said trust God. You know, it shows in people's lives. You can watch someone's life and see how much they really trust God. A relationship with God must be a relationship of, of trust and obedience. Growing in the confidence and assurance that our Lord Jesus Christ is in complete control of our lives. Trust, somebody say trust, trust. is the most important factor in knowing God and his will for our lives and growing in the kingdom as a steward. Now, finally, go with me to Proverbs chapter 3. I'm going to get ready to close in shortly. Proverbs chapter 3. 
want you to go to Proverbs chapter 3 this morning. And we're going to talk about this real quick. Are you there? It's up on the screens, I hope. Proverbs chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And we're going to read all the way through to verse 10. I don't have time to go into it, but Proverbs chapter 3 is profound. And there's six do's and seven results found here. It deals with everything of life. Verse 1, my son, do not forget my teaching. Listen, God's speaking. But keep my commands in your heart. The Bible says out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. Are you hearing me? Keep my commands in your heart. For they will prolong your life. Many years. Woo. And bring you, say it with me, bring you, come on, say it. Prosperity. Come on, say prosperity. You act like you're afraid to be prosperous. Then stay a broke monkey. I want to be blessed. I want to be prosperous. Because ah, you and I are the ones that support the kingdom of God. You and I are the ones that give for run for hope. You and I are the ones that support world evangelism. You and I are the ones that support the church so people can come and get saved. Their children can get raised here, get married here, so we can plant churches from here, so we can step into our new building. You and I are the ones. Are you hearing me? Now say... Prosperity. Prosperity, it's yours. If you, if you act like you don't want it, you might not get it. I don't know about you, but I know one day I'm going to write a check to United We Camp for a million dollars. That's right. Let's go back to the Word of God. They'll prolong your life many years. And bring you, say that word. I'm going to pray that God doesn't bless any of you. Stand to your feet right now. No. And bring you prosperity. Are you hearing God's word? Does God's word enter your heart and your mind? This is not Joe's. This is God's word. He promises. He said, listen, my son, my daughter. Keep my commands in your heart. Here's the result. They'll bring you long life. They'll, pro they'll prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Let's keep reading. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart. Because here's what it will produce. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Now, verse 4, do this. Verse 5, I mean. Trust in the Lord. So there we are. Somebody say trust. trust. Somebody say I trust the Lord. Trust. Come on, say I trust the Lord. Trust. trust in the Lord with all your heart. And here you go. This is for the home. And lean not on your own understanding. I hope they're teaching that in the homes. Don't Proverbs 3, 5 it. I hope they're teaching that in the church. Lean not to your own understanding. Here we go. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Mm. Don't be wise in your own eyes. That's a heavy verse. I could preach a whole series on that. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and avoid evil. Fear the Lord and avoid evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Verse 9, honor the Lord with your finances, with your wealth, and with the first fruit. Listen, the first fruit. In other words, of all your increase, everything that comes, you got to tithe from it, or that's all the seed you're going to have. You want God to multiply that seed? Then you tithe off of it. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with your finances, whatever income, with the first fruit. Of all, somebody say all. all, 
your crops. Then your barns will be filled. Your bank accounts, your family, you'll have joy, you'll have peace, you'll have prosperity, you'll have blessing. Come on, somebody. God, money can't buy peace. Money can't buy the joy of the Lord. Money can't buy happy. Money cannot buy how Money can't buy certain things, and God will bring those things into our lives because he's faithful. He's always faithful, even when we're not. Somebody say amen. You know he's been faithful even when you haven't been. Can I get a witness? So at the end of everything, God is sovereign. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. Just simply trust God in every area of our lives. It's so profound that he wrote out our life story before we ever lived one day. Isn't that beautiful? He wrote it out. And in there, he, in there, he put all the things he wants to bring into our lives. All the things. He knows every trial we we're ever going to face. He knows the outcome of it. God is a good God. God is faithful. C.S. Lewis wrote this. I love this. He put, in God you come up against something in which, every, in which in every respect is immeasurably superior to yourself. Unless you know God as that and therefore know yourself as nothing in comparison, you really don't know God at all. Mm. On the sovereignty of God, E. Stanley Jones wrote this. I saw in a flash that all men that all man-made kingdoms are shakable. The kingdom of self is very shakable. Center yourself on yourself as the center of yourself, and your kingdom will surely come to an end. <laughs> the kingdom of health is shakable, and in the end, death overtakes us all. Every kingdom is shakable but one, the kingdom of God. We need to settle the fact that God is the owner and controller of everything in our lives. We should always trust God. So, in conclusion of the matter, if we don't trust God in all, we really don't trust God at all. Right? God's in control of everything. If there's anything that I've learned that he, even my darkest days, God was in control. Even when things hit my life that I couldn't understand, that didn't make sense to me. Has something ever happened in your life that doesn't make sense? Where you didn't like it or you didn't, you, why did this happen? It could be a sudden death. It could be a sickness. It could be some trash. Something in your life. A door closing, a job ending, something you didn't understand. But you didn't realize when God closes one door, he's about to open another door. You didn't realize that there's life after death. Come on, somebody. You didn't realize God was really going to do something greater and bigger. We don't, we don't have. He says, your thoughts are not my thoughts and your ways are not my. Well, my thoughts are higher. My ways are higher. But either way, God is in control. When you trust God, God always works everything out for the good. Noah had to trust God. It had never rained before. Abraham had to trust God. That God would lead him where he had never gone before. Job had to trust God, even in pain and death, disaster. He trusted the sovereignty of God. What about Daniel in the lion's den? What about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Come on, somebody. Woo, my God. David had to trust God that what God had promised him would come to pass when he was being hunted. God is faithful to his promises. What promises has God given you? Even if they haven't come to pass, doesn't mean it ain't going to come to pass. Somebody say amen. amen. God's faithful. God's faithful. Now, I'm going to read something to you. I'm going to close in exactly four minutes, maybe. <laughs> I have this book. On the sovereignty of God. Old book. It was written in the turn of the century. An old, old treasure book on the sovereignty of God. And I happened to go into, uh, 
I, I was uh, preparing for this. I knew I was going to speak on this. And a few weeks ago, I went into my library. I have two different sections. And I went into another closet where I have, it's like a walk-in closet. I have some of my books, and I have a bedroom that I convert into my library. And so I happened to see the book, and I pulled it out. And I remembered I had spoken a series on the sovereignty of God many, many years ago. And I want to read you some stuff that I put together from several different books and different authors, and some are my own thoughts. But it talks about trusting God. You could trust God. And we're going to close with this this morning. I'm going to say some stuff, and then I'm going to challenge you to join in with me. Because life and death are in the power of your tongue. Say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. Life and death are in the power of your tongue. You know, I'm going to tell you something about my wife. One thing I love about Doreen, I love this about her. She's very positive. And if I start tripping and get a little negative, she reminds me. <laughs> Thank you, honey. Don't ever change. Amen. Okay. He's the one who made us. The heavens declare the glory of God. No means of measure can define his limitless love. Say amen. amen. No far-seen telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supply and love. I'm telling you, you could trust God. I want you to say, we trust you, God. Come on, I want you to say, we trust you, God. No, say it to him. Say it. Come on, act like he's listening, because he is. Sound God, we trust you, God. Jesus, we trust you. Woo! Yes, we do. No barrier can stop him from pouring out his blessings. He's enduringly strong. He's totally secure. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He's everything to us. We trust you, God. Come on, say it with me. We trust you, God. Do you want to go home and have lunch? Say, we trust you, God. <laughs> he can satisfy all your needs. He supplies strength to the weak. He's always available for those that are weary. He sympathizes. He sees. He guards. He guides. He heals the sick. He forgives our sins. Woo! Come on, somebody. He delivers the captives. He defends the weak. He protects what belongs to him. He rewards the faithful. He rewards the faithful. Say amen. amen. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the doorway of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's, a, he's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway to glory. Hallelujah. Say amen. He's the master of the mighty. He's the captain of the conquerors. He's the leader of heroes. He's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the prince of peace. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. Say amen. amen. Yes. His promises are sure. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His yoke is easy. And his burden is light. Hallelujah. Okay. I wish I could describe him. I wish I could describe him to you. But he's undescribable. Because he's uncomprehendable. He's, he's everything. Come on, somebody. He is everything. You can't get him out of your mind. You can't get him off your hands. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Pilate couldn't condemn him. Herod couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And thank God, the grave couldn't hold him. There's no one before him, and there'll be no one after him. He'll have no successor. You can't impeach him. 
and he's not going to resign. He's God Almighty. And we need to trust him. Somebody say, I trust him. Let's stand to our feet. I'm going to stop there.